Well, as the late comedian Roddy Dangerfield used to joke, I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. That was often the reputation of the NHL, particularly in the United States. But hockey is changing quickly. Our colleagues at TSN have run some numbers and discovered that scraps and scrappers are rarely part of the play now. As Darren Drager reveals, hockey is undergoing a fundamental change at every level of the game. Sault Ste. Marie, most know it simply as the Sioux, a blue collar city in Ontario's north. But when the work week winds down, folks here turn their attention to the best game in town. It's Friday night, hockey night in the Sioux. The Greyhounds are a storied team dating to 1919. Six NHL Hall of Famers played here, Wayne Gretzky among them. Now these players are hoping for a chance to realize their own dreams of making it to the NHL. Most are still teenagers. But there's something that separates this crop of players from previous versions of the team. It wasn't long ago that the Sioux Greyhounds, like most of the 60 junior teams in the Canadian Hockey League, spent a lot of time doing this. Potashio and Moletta are going to go at it. Center ice. During the 2009-2010 season, the Greyhounds piled up 85 fights. This year, they're on track for about 10, battling instead for first place in the Western Conference of the Ontario Hockey League. Scores! Their fans don't seem to mind the change. We love our two Greyhounds, and I'm telling you, junior hockey is the best hockey. You get to see the kind of magic they produce before they hit the NHL. With players like 20-year-old Blake Spears, the Greyhounds captain. Drafted by the NHL's New Jersey Devils, he's also suited up for Canada's National Junior Squad. You don't need a guy to go out there and beat a guy's face in in order to, to intimidate a team. It's scary enough if you got uh, four or five goals going in the back of your net. I'll stand up for my teammates, but I, I haven't necessarily been put in a position yet in my career that that I've had to drop my gloves. The Greyhounds general manager is Kyle Raftis. He kind of exemplifies what a, what a Greyhound player is. I don't think Blake's been in a fight. This is his fourth year here with us with the Greyhounds, and it's not a case that we ever look to him to set the tone that way. Being in my role, after, you know, I, I don't think I could sit there and tell any 16 to 19-year-old that they have to fight to, to make our team. The Greyhounds are at the forefront of a massive change across junior hockey, especially in the OHL, the Ontario Hockey League. A statistical analysis by TSN NW5 has found that while 20 years ago there were an average of two fights in every OHL hockey game, after introducing a series of rule changes, fights have now dropped to an average of one every three games. Zach Sinitian, a Boston Bruins first-round draft pick, leads the Greyhounds in goal scoring. I think where we're going is in the right direction and it's taking the glamour out of fighting, really, in, in hockey, and I think that uh, th that's good for, for a lot of these young players. With junior players now fighting less, the question is, how has that impacted fighting at the pro level? After all, the junior leagues are the main feeder system for the NHL a league where fighting has seemingly always had a place. Look, they're making it up. From its earliest days. What a fight. They even had to call in the police. Through the decades, fighting has been a part of the NHL. It reached its heyday in the 1970s. The Broad Street bullies in Philadelphia and bench-clearing brawls gave rise to a new type of hockey player and a new hockey term, the goon. From that point to the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, most teams carried a goon, also known as an enforcer. Letting him go. He'd be counted on to protect his team's skilled players. But sometimes he fought just to rile up his team and the crowd. Stage fights planned in advance were a mainstay of the game. You know, it makes the highlight reels. It's goals, maybe a big save, a hit in a fight. For 20 years, David Singer has posted videos on his website, hockeyfights.com. 
With a million visits per month during the hockey season, it's the go-to source for anyone interested in brawls across 10 leagues. There's always a crowd that's coming to the site that wants to remember the game they watched when they grew up. However it was, they're nostalgic for that game. But that game has changed. Singer's crunched the numbers and says that in the last several years, there's been a radical drop in the frequency of fighting in the NHL. Things have just gone down and down. If you were to look at, uh, you would put it on a graph, like a trending graph, it would have a nice steady decline. An analysis by TSN and W5 shows that fighting in the NHL peaked in the late 1980s, when there was an average of more than one fight every game. Today, fighting is down dramatically to an average of just one fight every three games. Goons are gone. For the most part, the role of the enforcers disappeared. Everybody has to pull their weight in multiple ways now. So you have really a, a different game overall than you had before, and a decline in fighting is just part of that. Intimidation was a part of the game. Ken Holland is the general manager of the NHL's Detroit Red Wings. He also worked in Detroit's front office in the late 1980s and early 90s, when the Red Wings boasted a pair of infamous enforcers. Probert and Kosher, the Bruce brothers, gave our franchise, our team, a lot of respect, which allowed our skilled players a comfort level that they could go out and do what they do. These days, Holland sees no reason to carry players like that. One-dimensional tough players that, that were really would play a few minutes on your roster and were really there to neutralize the other team's tough guy, that was down my um, priority list. Jim Rutherford, GM of the NHL's Pittsburgh Penguins, the 2016 Stanley Cup champions, agrees. You wouldn't have a one-dimensional player on your roster, I wouldn't think. The way our team was structured with the team we won the Stanley Cup, it was a well-balanced uh, four lines, six, uh, three pairs of defensemen, and all guys that, that could skate and, and play. He plays to win every night. Rutherford built that team with a focus on finesse instead of fists. When they won the Cup, the Penguins only had nine fights, second fewest in the league. Right now we have a very fast, high skill game. We have guys in the game that, that can fight and can play also. But we've got to the point where the, the intimidators, the stage fights are now uh, a thing of the past. So why the dramatic drop in fighting? Rule changes have played a big role. Some of these penalize those who instigate fights. Others have opened the game up for the skilled and speedy players. But there are other key factors that led to the shift. Among them, a new awareness of the perils of concussions and the toll of head trauma on fighters. We have to begin with some sad news from the world of hockey. Three retired enforcers, Wade Belak, Derek Bugard, Rick and Rick Rippon, died within a four-month period in 2011. Two were suspected to have died by suicide, Bugard by drug overdose. Both the public and the league were starting to lose their appetite for fighting, especially stage fighting. Blake Spears, captain of the OHL's Sioux Greyhounds, you see so many stories on, on enforcers and, and guys who the pain they go through uh, day in and day out where they know they have to fight somebody and, and the, the effects that that has on their mental health. When it comes down to it, the fate of fighting in pro hockey may ultimately reside with players like Spears and junior teams like the Greyhounds. There are guys that have that, that notion in their head that if they're going to make it to the next level they need to spark their team, they need to fight and they need to do all these, these physical feats in order to make it to the next level and uh, it's getting pretty clear that that's no longer the case. A single fight. It was my absolute least favorite part of the game. A young player lost. He didn't make it. When W5 continues. January 17th, 2009. The hockey community of Whitby, Ontario, 50 kilometers east of Toronto, comes together to remember one of its own. We love you, Donald, and we will miss you more than words can describe. 
truck. For Donna Sanderson, it was a night she won't easily forget, watching her son's hockey jersey raised to the rafters in remembrance. His life ended too soon while playing the game he loved. What did that expression of support mean to you? I remember it very vividly when I think about it, but it's not a memory that comes back easily because it is a very um, deep-rooted emotional memory. But it certainly did show us um, that the hockey community has a huge heart. If there was ever one event that served as a wake-up call to the hockey world about the dangers of hockey fighting and the need for drastic changes to the game, it was the death of Don Sanderson. Sanderson down the right side. He's got Just John 21 Russell years old, Sanderson played for the Whitby Dunlops of the senior level Ontario Hockey Association. He was, by all accounts, a tough guy. What do you think his view on fighting was? Don didn't love that aspect of the game. Um, he knew that that was something that he would be called upon to do. So as a team member, he accepted that as his role. As his mom, it was my absolute least favorite part of the game. In December of 2008, Don Sanderson got into a tussle with a member of the opposing Brantford Blast. During the fight, his helmet came off, and when he and his opponent fell, Don Sanderson's head hit the ice. His mother, Donna, was not at the game. So take us back to the night, the night that Don hit his head. How do you recall you reacted when you found out? I relive that day every December. It was actually a nurse from the hospital, and that's how I found out that my son had had a severe accident. All I was hearing on the phone was, he's hurt, there's bleeding in his brain, we have to transfer him. But they couldn't tell me where. I had to wait. Longest probably hour of my life. We followed the ambulance to the hospital. Little did we know that he was in that ambulance. So I literally arrived at the hospital the same time Donald did. And we were there for 21 days. But unfortunately, his life was over on January 2nd. He didn't make it. Don Sanderson's death made an immediate impact on David Branch, long-serving commissioner of the Ontario Hockey League and president of the Canadian Hockey League. It was, uh, wow. I mean, you, you just put your hat on as a parent and, and you look at what the Sanderson's had to go through and a young guy losing his life. I mean, it was, it, it was very impactful, very impactful. People forget, though, the Ontario Hockey League did offer a response. There were rule changes because of that. Yes, yes. You know, you don't like to respond <clears throat> based on emotion. We didn't think we were. We really gave it serious thought about uh, what had occurred there. and What could we do to hopefully never see that happen again? Sanderson's death prompted Branch and the OHL to bring in a rule that called for ejection and suspension of any player who deliberately removes his or his opponent's helmet in a fight. Branch had a chance to speak with the Sandersons. You know, it was a, a way of us showing that your son didn't necessarily lose his life in vain here. The rule changes were consistent with others Branch had made as OHL commissioner. He's led the charge in junior hockey to reduce fighting and improve players' safety. How has the role of fighting or the role of the fighter changed? Players that cannot bring something other than fighting no longer exist, and I feel comfortable in say, stating that. The Ontario Hockey League, as you know, changed its rules. You know, OHL Commissioner David Branch says that it was his way, the OHL's way of showing that Don's death had not been in vain. What does that mean to you? I think the gesture was well-meaning and, and it, it was a good 
move on their part. The question that I have, we're in 2017, Dom died in 2009, but they're still fighting. I, I'm, I mean, I, I have nothing else. They're still fighting. Even though the penalties and suspensions introduced by David Branch and the OHL have dramatically reduced fighting, others share Donna Sanderson's concerns. And some of these voices are coming from the unlikeliest of places. General manager of the NHL's New Jersey Devils, Ray Shiro. I've always felt very strongly that at the lower level, especially, I've always said junior hockey, I mean, development hockey, I think there's a zero place and should be zero tolerance for fighting. And I can't, it's hard for me to stomach the fact that we have 16-year-old kids or 18-year-old kids, 19-year-old kids that are actually allowed to fight. And it's, as a parent who had, you know, have had boys go through playing and it's hard to see. Ray Shiro's own father, Fred, coached the notorious Broad Street Bullies in Philadelphia in the 1970s. That team was widely considered the toughest in NHL history, relying on great goaltending, timely scoring, and intimidation to brawl its way to two Stanley Cups. Do you see the irony in Fred Shiro's son, the uh, architect, I suppose, of the Broad Street Bullies, advocating to some degree for a ban on fighting in the CHL? No, well, no, I think um, it really was a different era, and I really think what we know now, or where we are as a society, it's not acceptable. You can't do it on the street. You can't do it in a bar. You're in jail. And I don't think what good of it. I, there hasn't been a scouting meeting I've sat in in a long time where I asked the guy, can he fight? That is so gone now. And we're not developing fighters. We're developing hockey players. Do you foresee a point where the National Hockey League seriously looks at, if not adopts, an ejection penalty for fighting? And I wouldn't rule anything out in five years, 10 years, 15 years. But again, to me, it's going to be easier to make possible if we do it at the lower level and with the teenagers and eliminate it there. And then just through attrition, it's basically not going to be any fight in the National Hockey League. Experts call it the trickle-up effect. If the boys aren't being encouraged to fight, they likely won't be doing it as grown men. But that time hasn't come just yet for the NHL. Ken Holland, general manager of the Detroit Red Wings. I've never really had any desire to have a player on the roster that that's all he could do was fight. I, I wanted them to be able to kill penalties, to play 10, 12 minutes, to maybe score, score the odd goal. But I certainly understood that a fight could break out and we might have to do something. We might have to have somebody on the roster that was comfortable in that, in, in that, in that, in, in that environment. Somebody like Steve Ott. He started this season his 14th in the league with Ken Holland's Detroit Red Wings. Over his career, Ott has brawled more than 100 times. When you have a guy that goes out there and fights for you, he, he's honestly your heartbeat. And when the heartbeat uh, isn't there anymore, usually the team you know, becomes flat. But even he's had to change his game. You can't just rely on fighting. So for myself, I had to adapt in a situation where I had to be, able, be a player, be able to do things other than just go out there and run around, hit guys, and fight. Hockey fighting at all levels of the game is on the decline, maybe on the way out. But this evolution didn't come quickly enough for Donna Sanderson or her son, Don. Do you hold anyone responsible for what happened to Don? I don't hold any one person responsible for what happened. Um, it was an accident. The question that I do ask myself is, I mean, really, he was playing hockey. So like, why were they even fighting? It's a strategic game. It's a game of skill. How fast you can you skate? How much better can you pass and stick handle? Not who can rough the other guy up more. I mean, that's not hockey. You don't, I mean, that's got no place in any sport.